Welcome to History 111, Lecture 37, Abolitionism at the Forefront. Now, one of the things that happened as part of the Compromise of 1850 was the strengthening of the Fugitive Slave Act, and that allowed slaveholders to more easily reach in any state to retrieve runaway slaves. An accused fugitive no longer needed to be brought before a court. All that was necessary was to present an affidavit with a physical description of the runaway, and federal commissioners could turn over any person who appeared to be that individual. And it didn't have to be a particularly good description. Basically, anyone who was vaguely resembled the individual described could be arrested, even if that was someone who was had always been free, and that empowered federal marshals to also compel bystanders and led to stiff fines and imprisonment for those who obstructed, and were federal funds that were provided to pay the cost of recovering fugitives, and the fugitives did not have the right to speak in their own defense, they had no right of habeas corpus, and they had no access to the courts. And all of this deeply offended people in the North, not only because they felt that this was wrong and a violation of many rights, but because they could also be compelled to face jail or prison sentences if they did not assist in what they felt was morally wrong. In response to this act, many militant abolitionists vowed to prevent the kidnapping and return of fugitive slaves through civil disobedience and mob violence, and despite a number of well-publicized rescues, more than 300 alleged fugitives were enslaved. Now, the first forcible re-enslavement inspired Harriet Beecher Stowe to write Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was set out to show the dehumanizing side of slavery and becomes a major piece of abolitionist literature, which also helps build and spur on the movement. Another incident that severely outrages Northern abolitionists is the 1857 decision by the Supreme Court regarding Dred Scott. And in this decision, the Supreme Court denied citizenship to all persons of African descent and invalidated the Missouri Compromise in its entirety. Abolitionists and Republicans were convinced in, at this stage in what they called the slave power conspiracy and that Southern Democrats were colluding to force slavery everywhere within the country. Now, within the North, slavery is becoming more and more of an issue, and a young Republican by the name of Abraham Lincoln is going to go ahead and challenge Douglas for his seat in the U.S. Senate, and Douglas, for all intents and purposes, is the leader of the Northern Democrats. So Lincoln is going to go ahead and argue that a nation cannot remain forever half free and half slave. He talks about a house divided and how it cannot stand. Now, Douglas is going to say that he has no interest in slavery per se and defends its existence in the South, and he talks about this issue and abolition in very careful terms. Now, now, Douglas is going to narrowly win re-election, but he's going to lose favor in the South because he didn't defend the expansion of slavery as vigorously as Southern Democrats wanted. And at the same time, it's also going to elevate Lincoln to national prominence, and he's going to become the main voice against the Dred Scott decision and against slavery in general. Now, John Brown is another individual who takes action in 1858, and he decides to use direct violence. And what he wants to do is he's going to seize the federal arsenal and permit a slave uprising. His raid is subdued quickly, but it's going to generate fears of a slave insurrection in the South. Now, Northerners see Brown as a martyr to the anti-slave cause, and but the Southerners are going to see him as evidence of a strong conspiracy against their way of life, and this is going to really help contribute to the unraveling of the Union two years later. Now, in the election of 1860, the Democrats are divided between a pro-slavery Southerners and Western Democrats who favor popular sovereignty. The Western Democrats are going to nominate Douglas, and the Southern Democrats are going to nominate Beckenridge. Now, the Constitutional Union Party, which is the last remnants of the Whigs, are going to nominate a man named Bell, and the Republicans are going to come together behind Lincoln. And Lincoln was really made into a national figure out of those debates with Stephen Douglas. So what's the big idea here? Well, the Compromise of 1850 ultimately pours a lot of fuel on the abolitionist fire, and the divide between the North and the South really grows over issues like John Brown and Dred Scott. And importantly, there's a political realignment that's going to push Abraham Lincoln right to the forefront of American politics. See you in the next lecture.